reading today comes from Romans 12, verse 9 onwards. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate the lowly with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay one no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Thank you, Bianca. Let's all uh, bow our heads in prayer and just take a moment to reflect on the scripture that was just read. Maybe the Holy Spirit's highlighting something specifically for you. I'll give you a few seconds to do that this morning. Lord, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you for your scriptures that are alive, sharper than any two-edged sword. I pray, Holy Spirit, for the activation of your word into our lives. We understand that you, Jesus, are the living word. We pray, God, that you would help me to speak through uh, the, the words that you desire me to speak and to think your thoughts, Lord, that we may, we may meet you in a powerful way, uh, not by might, not by power, but by your spirit, Lord, it says in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Can you say hi to a few people around you before you take a seat this morning? So good to have you all here with us this morning. Um, we're actually going to, I just wanted to start things off differently, and this is something that I wanted to do each week, actually, which is kind of new. I didn't do it in the first service, so you, you get the special treat of this um, uh, we're going to give praise reports every, um, every Sunday that we get praise reports. And I just wanted to highlight three praise reports. How many of you know God answers prayer? I think it's important to just highlight what God is doing, right? Uh, many of you know the Cabreras, Neil and May, are praising God for their new house. Thank you so much for remembering. Uh, this is for our, our prayer team that prays for them. Uh, also uh, from Leah. Uh, she wanted to praise God that she finally bought her first car. To God be the glory in all of this. And then uh, Este, uh, breakthrough for the one that she's discipling. Uh, her, her husband's been going to a men's group and just seeing breakthrough in, in the life of the one that she's mentoring and discipling. And uh, now they're, they're starting to see the whole family uh, attend uh, church, so we praise God for that. So, if you do have any praise reports, we we I uh, would love for you. To, we have a prayer corner outside there, and I wanted to shout out Alma, who's just been uh, so so key in leading our prayer ministry here uh, at at Central alongside Steph and Logan. Can we give it up for Alma, who who does that for us? So if you do have any prayer needs, uh, life group leaders as well for your life groups, uh, there is a prayer wall, there, there are cards there for you to write down your prayer needs. And also if you have uh, praise reports, uh, please do post them up there because we want to celebrate because uh, God is enthroned on the praises of his people. And so we want to make a throne room for God to be seated upon and as we praise him and thank him for everything that he has done. All right, uh, we are in a series called We Are. And uh, in this series, we are going through the values of our church, Every Nation Brisbane, which is a part of the Every Nation family of churches and ministries that exist to honor God by establishing Christ-centered, spirit-empowered, and socially responsible churches and campus ministries in every nation. Uh, we are currently in just over 80 nations. Uh, we are one of um, just over 500 churches around the world in those nations. And so we're going through our values as a 
church and we've been going, we went through discipleship as the first value. Last week we went through outreach and this week we are going to do like the old sister sledge song, we are family. Turn to somebody and sing the song. I got all my sisters with me, right? Yes, and brothers. All right. When we talk about family here in our church, we talk about it not being a place for our families and marriages to be sacrificed on the altar of ministry. Uh, we also see church as a spiritual family, a community of faith that Jesus laid his life down for because he loved us so much. Now, as I was thinking about uh, this, I was reading in a book uh, called Creating Community by Andy Stanley. And Andy Stanley is a pastor at North Point Church in Atlanta, USA. And his wife is an architect. And he was talking about how he saw his wife reading an article about the trends of architecture of homes that's happening uh, across the, especially the Western nations. I know um, my sister Katja probably noticed this as somebody who's in that field. Um, there's a trend now of the, um, uh, as, as you build homes, and this, this is evident even here, and especially here in Queensland with the typical Queenslander home, is the, uh, is the transition from having porches to now having decks. So uh, what used to be in a generation past, there, there would be the emergence of building a house with a porch on the front of your house, right? So that you can see what's happening in the neighborhood, right? Like you can greet your neighbors as they pull up. Like most uh, suburbs back in the day would not have fences and fence lines because they would just peer over at their neighbor and, how are you doing, neighbor? Oh, I'm great. They'll talk to each other. Uh, you know, you'd come back from like, say, a Sunday drive after church and you'd come into your, uh, your, your driveway and your neighbor would see you and you'd talk or maybe invite you to come on the porch and maybe pour a beverage and you'd sit down and have a beverage together. How many of you have ever experienced this uh, Oh, none of us. All right. <laughs> I remember growing up uh, in New Zealand, in Auckland, New Zealand. Now, uh, where I lived, there's an area called Mount Wellington in East, um, in East Auckland. And when my parents bought our home, um, we were the only, uh, at least on our side of the street that we lived, we were the only Pacific Islanders on my street. Um, we were surrounded by elderly people, actually. And uh, the reason why I can still remember it to this day is the names of the neighbors that we had was because we'd always go over and visit the neighbors and they would come over. I remember growing up and uh, on if, you, if you're facing the street, on the right-hand side was uh, Mrs. Lapanovich. She was a widow. And then on the left side was uh, Buddy and June who lived there. Uh, they, were, they, they were there and we'd always go over to their house. I was always fascinated by uh, Bud's. Uh, but when you'd walk into the foyer of his home, like we'd walk into the front of his home, he had this massive sword that he got during the war somewhere. And I was always fascinated by that. Across the road, immediately across the road was Mrs. Hughes. And then uh, I never knew the name of the couple because my parents would always tell them, tell us to call her Nanny and him Pop. So we'd always go over to these homes. And, you know, for the Pacific Islanders in here, um, my, my mom would always bake these pineapple pies. Any of you know about pineapple pies? And she would always go, yeah, go, son, go take this to Mrs. Lepanovich. And, uh, and I would always go take it there and, and expect, okay, here you go, Mrs. Lepanovich. I'm going to go now. She's like, no, no, son, come and have a seat. And we'd sit down and have a cup of tea. Her tea always tasted weird, but like I'd, I'd sit there just to be nice. And this was the way I kind of grew up in, in 1980s. Uh, yes, some of you weren't even born there. 1980s, uh, uh, Auckland, New Zealand, and suburbia of New Zealand. And uh, this is the way things are. I, I've actually been back a number of times uh, where my, uh, my mom sold the uh, family home, and now my, my sister has her own home in South Auckland, and we obviously have our home here in, in Brisbane. And I was just really interested to see the transformation. Now nobody knows their neighbors, Right? Uh, and we live in a society, too, where although <laughs> I, I know my neighbors uh, reasonably well, I know Tina's sitting back there. I didn't tell you this, Tina, uh, but just as I was on my way, I was parked. Okay, I'm being honest now. Okay, church confession time. Uh, but I was parked uh, last night 
where I wasn't breaching the driveway of the specific neighbor that we have, <laughs> but I, I was I was kind of close to the driveway, and I was, I was a, a nice note was left on my uh, window wipers. Can you park better next time, please? And I said, sure, I'll take that and not let that affect my day because I have to preach to my spiritual family this morning. But the the whole point of what I'm making here is just how architecture and how we architect our lives, now we have more decks than porches out the front. Maybe some of us have noticed this in our own homes. My home is similar, although we did build a little deck out the front. Uh, (laughs) It is shielded by a fence, so we don't really see the neighbors go past. Um, But they're seeing less porches and more decks at the back. And this speaks to uh, just a lot of how homes are designed now for privacy, or as Australians say, privacy, because uh, it's, it's, it's kind of like architecting our lives no longer for deeper connection across ethnic or generational lines or even property lines where we want to have a space for our own privacy. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, but it just, it has fruit to it, right? Um, at the University of Sydney, um, uh, Professor Melody Ding, she did extensive um, Sir, research around uh, the topic of uh, the epidemic that is loneliness. And because we are a social species, it's usually a signal, loneliness is a signal for our bodies craving for social interactions and togetherness. It's like hunger. Don't worry, I'm going to keep this message within the time frame because I can already start to hear you, your stomachs praising God. Uh, Like hunger when we reach out for food or thirst when we reach out for water. It's like a signal, our body's signal for us to not be alone. We're noticing here in Australia that the average family size is getting smaller. And as a result, churches are getting smaller for the most part. Um, There are some exciting stats to see some growth in certain sectors of the church but people aren't seeing the importance of community interaction because there's more of a prevalence towards individualism. So what ends up happening is social media, and again, social media is not evil, it's amoral, meaning that it's, it's the, the morality of social media is determined by how you use it, right? But social media has given us more of a concept of reaching out wider and not as deep in that sense of Connection and communication is falsely given to us as as if that is a depth, but we often filter our projection of who we are, not allowing people to come into the space of seeing us for who we really are. And so um, what Professor Ding was, was actually saying is a lot of that remedy would be to architect society in such a way where we have to have spaces that we do interact. For instance, public spaces like our parks, or to walk slowly through your neighborhood. We live in a very car-dependent society. Uh, Before living here, 10 years ago, I used to live in Singapore, and uh, you had to be, like, super uh, wealthy or affluent to have a vehicle, a car. I know some of us have lived in Singapore. Uh, So we were forced to use public transport, and by being forced to use public transport, they gave uh, a means to hopefully interact, although if you go on what they call the MRT, most of the time everyone's on their phones, right? So in a car-dependent society like Brisbane, because in order to get places, you kind of need to know somebody with a car or have a car because uh, the public tra- transport system here is good, it's okay, but, it, you know, if you're to get to a specific place, you, you usually ride in a car uh, to get there. It's more convenient. Here are the trends from NCLS, which is an organization here in Australia that actually highlights uh, church trends. And what you're seeing here is uh, the denominations and the various streams of Christian faith uh, and their growth over the last few years. And uh, of course, what you see is the Protestant is slightly going up, but it's only going up because of the growth within the Pentecostal denominations whereas most other Protestant and especially mainstream Protestant uh, churches are seeing a decline, a steady decline in church attendance and church growth. And the reason being, a lot of the reason being is because what is happening in society is we're wanting to uh, not engage in community or relationship necessarily because it's 
completely countercultural to come into an environment like this and actually extend ourselves towards being open in relationship. And then to add on top of that, an experience like every nation. And I want to honor you for taking this step of faith to be here today, not just to attend church, but to extend yourself in relationship with one another. It's not all about just coming here to do church, but actually extending yourself across the aisle and building in a church called Every Nation because it's easy to sit in a comfort zone where you go to a more mono-ethnic experience or a mono-generational experience where everybody's specifically around my suburb or my ethnicity or my demographic or my generation. To be a part of an intergenerational, intercultural church takes huge faith. So I want you you to give yourselves a hand for coming to a church like every nation because this is what heaven's going to be like. See, the only place where we're seeing growth is in the Pentecostal sector or denominations of churches, of which we are a part of that um, that sector of churches because we are spirit-filled. We believe the gifts are available. It's not just a cultural thing, but Pentecostalism speaks towards um, the Holy Spirit and the gifts being alive today. We do believe in miracles, amen? We do believe that God's still active. And so this is the society of which we face, of which we are creating this environment here in this building every Sunday and throughout the week for the cultivation of these types of family relationships uh, where we are called to lean in. This is the church that God has designed. And I want to honor you for taking that step with us. See, when we look at scripture, some of you are looking at me like, okay, when are we going to get to the Bible? We're here now, okay. When we look at the beginning of the Bible, how many of you noticed the pattern of where God is in the midst of his creation. He creates the light and the darkness in the midst of the nothingness. And then he looks upon it and he creates different things on different days. And what's the phrase that he says at the end of those days? He says, upon his, as he looks upon his creation, he says what? It is good, good, that's right. It is good. So let me ask you this question. When is the first time that God says it is not good? Hmm, go on, Bianca. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, it says, The Lord God said, it is not good. Everybody say not good. It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. Okay, let me just put a side point here. Shout out to all my Filipinos in the house. Helper does not mean the kind of helper you think, right? It's not Indai. That's not the helper that we're talking about here. Okay, helper here is somebody who accentuates who you are to bring the glory of God in terms of how he has imaged us to be in that togetherness, male and female, Genesis 1, right? Uh, Helper is also the word in the Greek translation of the Hebrew, uh, the word parakletos, which means uh, the one who is one with you. And so God has created us for relationship. Not just with a spouse or a significant other, but with people. He designed for us to walk with people. See, here was Adam, right? Walking around, naming animals. That was the first job, was as a zoologist and as a botanist. He's naming species of animals. But he was noticing that, you know, the giraffe is not really doing it for him. So, you know, like in relationship. So what does God say? It's not good for man to be alone. You were designed to not be alone. Hebrews chapter 10 emphasizes this. The author of Hebrews writes, and let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together. That's the commandment. Don't give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. Don't grow that habit. Fight to get here. Grow the habit of saying, you know what, no matter what, I'm gonna fight to gather, to meet together. And it's not just because you need it, but us walking together is a reflection of God's glory to the rest of Brisbane society. Togetherness is God's solution for the social epidemic that is loneliness. And this is why God has created spiritual family, to reflect his design of family. 
God so loved the world that he gave his only answer? No, he gave relationship, his son, so that whoever believes in him should not die but have eternal life. I'm going to highlight five characteristics of spiritual family. I'm going to invite you to write these down because this is really going to help you this morning to really look at God's design for how we are called to walk together. Are you ready for this? Turn to somebody and ask them, are you ready for this? Spirit fingers. All right, here we go. Five characteristics of spiritual family. The first one, which is kind of two in one, all right? That's the kind of pastor I am. Buy one, get one free. Here we go. Generosity and hospitality. Generosity and hospitality. So back to our porch analogy. Back to this whole idea of the porch. Acts chapter 2, right? Acts chapter 2 is where we read about the first church. Jesus ascends to the heavens in in Acts chapter 1. In Acts chapter 2, they're all praying. The Holy Spirit descends upon them. 3,000 people uh, come to know Christ. They they get saved, and then they start the first community, the first church community. And it looks like this. All things they had in common. They shared all their belongings, sold all their possessions to benefit the church, but also to benefit one another and gave the proceeds to those who were in need. For some of us in this in this that are familiar with Marxism and socialism, we would probably say, oh, this is such a socialist gospel. No. <laughs> who came first, Marx or Jesus, right? So <laughs> Marx obviously took this from Christ's model, but took the God out of it and said people can do it themselves. And we've unfortunately seen the result of that, especially in the last century. And so what we're seeing here is God's design for the interaction of people. They were generous. They put into practice what Paul would eventually write later on. Let nothing be done out of selfish ambition or conceit. This is Philippians 2 verse 3. But in the loneliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. Wow. Can you see how antithetical this is to what Australian society says? Australian society says me and mine, my fence line. Kingdom of God says everything I have is yours and for us to share. If I have something that you can benefit from, if I have skills of which you can benefit from or how I can serve you, then I will serve you with what I have because I know God's got my back. He's provided for me and he's blessed me to be a blessing. I knew I would. I was hoping for at least half an amen on that point. All right. So rather than thinking about their positions and proceeds, that could benefit themselves, they thought about how they could help the community, their brothers and sisters in Christ. So we see this in Romans chapter 12, verse 13 here. Uh, Verse 12 says, rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer, contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. I want you to see here, it's not just for the lost. It actually says here, the needs of the saints. So it's those who are already followers of Jesus, You'll never know what each other needs unless you ask. And let me, and let me say this as well as your pastor. We want to create an environment where if you do need something, you can actually ask as well. Rather than being ashamed, oh, I don't know. I don't want you to see that I actually need something. We want you to be able to voice it. I'm not saying that I'll be able, able to answer it, uh, but maybe within the body of Christ, we won't be able to see whatever it is that you need fulfilled the way that God has designed. First Peter 4 verses 8 to 10 says, And above all things have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. Okay, here you go. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. So we're to welcome those who are a part of this biblical community and to those outside of this community as well. We aren't to welcome strangers because they haven't earned the right. Instead, we're to welcome them because of who we are as adopted children of God. We're no longer orphans. So how do we put this into action? I want to give you an acronym this morning. And the acronym is around the word SHINE. Everybody say SHINE. So this is what hospitality can look like. Like maybe you're thinking, well, Pastor Nelly, I want to be hospitable, but I'm broke. Well, we can start here, okay? Just shine. Everybody say shine. Okay, S-H-I-N-E. Let's just start with this, okay? First, S, smile. Turn, turn to your neighbor, make sure they've got a nice smile. Turn around, make, make, just check, check, do a smile check. 
sponsored by Colgate. Here we go. Smile, okay? Start by smiling. Start by smiling. It's, it's, it's so welcoming when you see somebody smile at you. Hey, how's it going? You got something in your teeth. All right. Here's, here's the H, okay? The H is hello, okay? Greet well. Greet somebody well. Okay? Say hello. Thirdly, interest. Show interest in the person. You know, the person, hello, how are you? And they say, oh, my mom died and my dog got run over. Oh, that's great. You know, you didn't listen at all. You're not showing any interest, okay? Maybe learn to ask better questions. That might help to provoke interest. Like, act interested or actually be interested in the person. Okay, so smile, say hello, be interested. Uh, Fourthly, this is where I get, um, this is where I start to fail, be um, name. I'm sorry for everybody I've called bro, okay? <laughs> How you going, bro? <laughs> and Tina's like, I'm not your bro. Uh, <laughs> like, like, learn to know the names of the people that are around you. Because if, if I remember your name or if you remember mine, and some of you are looking at me like, I'm going to put you to the test now, Pastor Nelly. Uh, do you know the amount of times that I've gone to Boost or Starbucks and they still call me Neil? Um, but learn, learn a person's name. When, when, when you remember a person's name, then um, you're able to, they see that they, they feel welcomed and hospitable. And then E, so smile, hello, interest, name, and then lastly, exit well. So when you leave the place, you know, look for an opportunity to be a blessing. They just go, I'll see you, and walk, walk off. Like, look for an opportunity for, to, for further connection or uh, maybe be a blessing. Hey, I just really feel like, can I pray for you? Can I give you something? Or just like, uh, look forward to meeting you again. Encourage well, but exit well because lasting impressions usually are the last impression. All right. That is the first one. And secondly, we're going to talk about empathy. Um, empathy. The Bible calls us to be empathetic, to understand another's feelings, and to feel what they feel. But looking for the hope that we can find in Christ. There's a difference between pity and empathy. Pity just goes, oh, you poor thing. But doesn't look for the hope that we have in Christ. Um, God has not designed us to stay in the valley of the shadow of death, though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death. But it's, empathy says, I will walk through it with you. But let's walk. Let's go. Uh, Romans 12, 15 says, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Uh, a further extension of this understanding is in 1 Corinthians 12, which also highlights um, God's design for us to walk together as community by calling us the body of Christ. And he highlights different gifts that different people might have as a part of the body of Christ. But then he goes on to talk about in 1 Corinthians 12 how when a part of the body rejoices, the rest of the body rejoices with that part of the body. And when a part of the body is hurt, the rest of the body comes to alleviate that pain. Uh, any of you woken up in the middle of the night Maybe to, uh, we won't talk about what you do in the middle of the night, but you know, maybe you're going to, to use the facilities, let's just say that, right? And you wake up in the middle of the night, and maybe, you know, you're like me, you are uh, visually impaired a little bit, and so you're trusting your sense of direction uh, to get you to where you need to go in the middle of the night, being half awake, and then maybe on the corner of your bed or on the corner of a drawer somewhere, you stub your little toe. Anybody ever experienced that? Uh, I have, and uh, you know, may, and you know, notice how your body reacts. Your other leg starts to hop. Your uh, out of your mouth comes the praises of God, Hallelujah, and, and the rest of your body crunches down to to see if your little toe's not bleeding or whatever. You know, like the, that experience. That that's what it's like to be a part of the body of Christ. When a part of the body hurts. Uh, everybody comes to alleviate and to express that hurt alongside that part of the body. But the immediate response is, how can we alleviate that pain? That's the way that God has called us to be a part of the body of Christ. Galatians 6 verse 2, for those of you taking notes, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Galatians 6 2 says, uh, Colossians 3 12 says, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved 
compassionate hearts. God wants you to be compassionate. And let me just say this, compassionate towards people that you naturally wouldn't gravitate towards. Let me get, uh, just, just put some, um, put a handle on this one. How do we show empathy in action here? Uh, we listen. We listen to one another. And before listening, we've got to understand that I may have an opinion that differs and I may be passionate about that opinion. Ever been in those conversations when you're dying to say something to counter what's being said? I have. But empathy chooses to listen, to try and pursue compassion for other people's experiences, to put aside our perspectives, to think from the other person's point of view when they're walking with them through difficult times especially. Uh, The third quality is humility. Humility is the antithesis of pride, right? Which displays itself in examining the sins of others without seeing it in your own heart first. Last week we talked about becoming an accidental Pharisee, the thinning out of the church or the thinning out of the of the body of Christ rather than seeing the the body of Christ as an exciting environment for people to come and be welcomed home. It's when we become full of pride and we can't see that these seats that are around us that are empty are actual opportunities for people to be welcomed home because we see that as an inconvenience. I don't want to grow my life group because that just sounds inconvenient. mean I have to care for these people? Oh, man. Matthew 7 verses 3 to 5 puts it this way. This is Jesus talking to the uh, disciples. He says, And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, Hey, let me remove the speck from your eye. And look, a plank is in your own eye, you hypocrite. This This is the Bible. This is Jesus talking, not me. Hypocrite, first remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Maybe the reason why there's repeated patterns in your own life of pride is because you don't recognize that the plank actually affects your vision and it affects the way you walk and you walk that way. The root of all sin is pride and idolatry. It's pride. When we're prideful, we don't operate the way that God has designed us to walk. Verse 3 of Romans 12, for by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. The book of Proverbs talks about, let another man's lips praise you and not your own. If you're the only one presenting how awesome you are, maybe you're not as awesome as you think you are. Scriptural principle there. Humility in action, it's exercising a measure of faith. And whatever that measure of faith is, serve others with that measure of faith. It's not for you to put on a business card or your Instagram bio, hey, look, I have this measure of faith. But it's actually taking that measure of faith, how small mustard seed it might be or how big it might be, but using it to serve, not to advertise how great you are, but to serve others who aren't in that place. Fourthly is unity. The Bible tells us we are to live in unity. Unity doesn't mean that we are to discourage diversity or the use of our own unique spiritual gifts. It also doesn't mean that we will always share the same opinion on all matters. The Bible says that we are to stand firm as believers. Philippians 2 verse 2 says, Fulfill my joy by being like-minded having the same love, being of one accord and one mind. Ephesians 4 verses 5 and 6 says, One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. He is the one who unites us. Romans 12, again, verses 17 and 18. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Live in peace with all people. This is really important. So seeing unity in action doesn't necessarily mean that I will agree with everything that 
that you may have be passionate about. I mean, even in this room, there may be differences from everything like sports team allegiances to political opinions. On things that don't really matter in the scope of eternity, there's room for diversity. But when it comes to the center of our faith, Jesus Christ and his gospel, we center our faith, our church, and our unity around who he is. It's really important. Lastly, turn to somebody and say, we made it, we made it. Last one, last one. Last one is the hardest one, right? Forgiveness. (laughs) Romans 12, verses 18 to 19. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves. But leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. It's on him. Ephesians 4, verse 32 says, and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as Christ has forgiven you. I love the reality of what Jesus says in, uh, right at the end of when he teaches the Lord's Prayer, which we will say at the end of the service. He says, for if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive people their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. So one way that this biblical community, I'm not just talking specifically about Ian Brisbane, but the body of Christ throughout Brisbane. One way that we differ and are set apart from others is the way that we should have a quickness and heart to forgive. And it's not easy because we all sin and we sin against each other. Our words and our actions can hurt others. and They could also hurt us. But we must remember what Paul said, right? In in Colossians 3 verse 13, we bear with one another and forgive one another. If anyone has a complaint against one another, even as Christ forgave you, so also you must do. And this results in brotherly love. One of my favorite parts of scripture here in in Romans 12. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. Some of us are going to like, okay, I'm going to take him for lunch. So if somebody takes you for lunch, it's probably because, no, I'm just kidding. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. And if he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. I won't prolong this because I know Tina does an amazing teaching on this as well. But burning coals on your head is not what you think. It's not like avenging. It's actually an opportunity to serve others with that forgiveness. Uh, Verse 21, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly or sisterly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Biblical community is centered on love. Hopefully we've learned this. The end of 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter, talks about three things will remain, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is what? Love. Love is what is God's stamp on his church for the rest of the world to see. But it starts with him, right? If I can just highlight this scripture, one of my favorite scriptures in all the Bible, 1 John 4, 7 to 8, which says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves is part of God and knows God. He or she who does not love does not know God, for God is love. And then later on in that chapter, in verse 18 to 19, he actually says this, right? He says, There is no fear in love, which is the reason why we put decks at the back rather than porches up the front because we're afraid often of what people might see in us. So let's be safe. Let's be secure in who we are. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because what? He first loved us. Thankful for that love today. That God so loved the world that he sent his only son out of his relationship. I'm going to end with this thought. We started with talking about porches. I'm going to end with talking about porches today. 
And Luke chapter 15 is probably the most popular parable, uh, the prodigal son or the lost son. And at the end of the parable, the son who's given the inheritance finds himself squandering the wealth on prostitutes and drugs and drinking, and he loses everything, he loses his money, and when he loses his money, he loses his friends. Finds himself, what, lonely. At the bottom rung of society, in the midst of mud, eating what pigs eat. And he was like, if I, even my, my dad's servants are treated better than this. He makes his way back home thinking, I'm just going to go home and just, if, if my dad will have me as a servant, I'll take it. And where is the dad? Dad sees him. He's on the porch. Now, it doesn't say porch, but he's definitely on the front of his house looking out for his son. And when he sees his son, the Bible says that he runs after his son. In order for somebody of great stature as an ancient Hebrew man to run, he would be wearing robes that are fitting to his figure. So in order for him to run, he would have to raise up his robe above his knees so as to get room for his legs to run. He didn't care about his dignity at that point. He wants to welcome his son home, back home into family. And this is God's desire for us to be his body, to be the ones who represent him in society, to welcome people home. The invitation is to the porch. And in the same way that he has called us home to the porch, he also calls us to look out for others. This is the invitation to the porch. The Lord would say, I desire to put people on your heart to invite home. I desire to give you prophetic perspective to be able to see these empty seats in this room, not just to fill this room for, so that we feel better, but to fill this room with people that need to find their way home. This is our home. For those of you who call this church your family, this is our home. We get to invite people. Some of us may be visiting from other churches. My encouragement to you is to go back to your churches and create environments within that church to, for people to come home. This is our home. So I want to pray for us this morning as a spiritual family. And we're going to pray for one another right around where we are. If you came in here uh, as a family or a couple, I want you to find another couple or a family to pray with just to see God's establishment even, even more so of spiritual family in our own lives. I've got questions up on or, or statements up on the screen. Ask God who he might be connecting you with to invite onto your porch and will you receive God's invitation to our Every Nation Brisbane porch or to help others find home? I want to pray for us this morning and I'll give us the opportunity to answer this. Father, thank you for the invitation onto your porch, onto just, just to come home, be found home. I'm thankful, Lord, for all of us in this room who have found this place that we get to call home. And we pray, Holy Spirit, for those who are around us that don't necessarily know what it's like to find spiritual family, I, I pray, God, um, just remembering Psalm 68, verse 6, which states, Lord, that the desolate dwell in a dry land, but you welcome the isolated into family. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to help others to find family here, find family in the body of Christ pray for every discussion, every person in here that's feeling just a sense of loneliness, just a sense of isolation, even in this room. I pray, Lord, that they would reveal, uh, the revelation is that they are designed for connection, relationship, and how we might walk in that deeper relationship with one another. In Jesus' name, and everyone said amen. All right, take a moment right now, just with the people around you, just to pray through that. And if any of you, look, I, let me just say this too. If any of us are dealing with loneliness, I want this to be the kind of environment as well where we can be honest about it so that we can pray for one another and, and pray for deeper connection even in this. So go ahead, let's take some, take some time to pray. Worship team, come on up. Get ready to.
Hey, we're so thankful that you can join us here today at Every Nation Brisbane. We hope and pray that you were impacted deeply by God's challenge in the message or in the worship. Please do let us know how we can pray for you, uh, either in the chat or you can message us or email us at info at enbrisbane.org. Again, if you want to learn more about who we are as a church, you can also uh, interact with us on our website, uh, which is enbrisbane.org and you'll learn more about who we are obviously we're on all the socials we're on facebook instagram youtube twitter we're on all of that and you can interact with us there or hear more uh, all about uh, what we're doing as a church we'd love to hear from you let us know how we can serve you let us know how we can pray for you and stand with you in everything that god is doing in and through your life no matter where you're from we're just really blessed that you could be here. Thank you for all of you who continue to sow faithfully into our church here. If you want to learn more about how you might be able to sow, you can go onto our website at enbrisbane.org slash give, and you'll see all the information there with regards to how you might sow. We just thank you so much for continuing to sow into all that God is doing in this church and through this church into the kingdom of God here in Brisbane. And so we're really thankful that you are here with us today and we pray that you would have a blessed week ahead let us know how we can stand with you stay in contact and let's continue to walk in everything that god has for us as we honor god and we love people grace and peace